25 minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, you never really learn everything about history. There's always something. And, and if you have an interest in certain eras in history and you find out that a new book has been written, you say, wow, what didn't I know already? And you're going to find out right now what you didn't know about World War II. Um, or maybe I have that wrong. I think I might have that wrong. Uh, Michael Corda is on the phone. He's the former editor-in-chief of Simon & Schuster. He was awarded the Order of Merit of the Republic of Hungary for his participation in the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. Is that enough credentials to get to get you going? Uh, he's an historian. He's a best-selling author. His new book is called Alone. Uh, if you're looking at the video feed that I'm doing right now, the live uh, broadcast of this online, I have the cover of the book on there. And if you go to Amazon, you will see that it is number one in the new release category for, for French history. Uh, so anything I've said wrong, f please forgive me. Let's say hello to uh, Michael Corda and get everything straightened out. Good morning, Michael. How are you? Good morning. I think you've gotten everything right so far, so let, we shouldn't worry about it. All that. right. Thank you so much. Where are you? Where are you calling from? I'm actually at the moment, well, where I'm from is England, but where I live in um, Pleasant Valley, New York, which is uh, outside Poughkeepsie, um, and, um, and we have a horse farm up here, um, uh, and I go into the city from time to time, but, um, uh, but basically I'm now a country dweller. <laughs> okay, so wh what led to the book? How did this come to be one of the, the pieces of work that you dedicated so much of your life to? Well, I've always been interested in Dunkirk. When I was a child, um, I was six when the war broke out um, in London, and, and seven when Dunkirk took place. So I knew a fair amount about it, but I also I had the experience of being there even as a child. I mean, I'm not saying that as a child I was totally aware of everything that was going on around me, because sure. what child is. Right, right. But, but on the other hand, you know, I remember sitting around the, uh, the, the table with my father and my mother and, 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 and the rest of the, the house listening to uh, the Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, tell us that we were at war with Germany in, on September 3rd, 1939. And I remember my mother going down to the station to, um, to give um, sandwiches and, and, and biscuits and beer to the troops as they came back from Dunkirk on the train, um, you know, soaked, wet, unshaven, without their boots or helmets, yeah. off, many of them without their rifles. So there's an immediacy to this, which 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 has always been present in me. In addition to that, I think it's a it's a critical moment in history because when France began to collapse, when Belgium collapsed, and Holland collapsed and surrendered, the British army was left um, with no place to go but the sea. Um, and if that army had been effectively trapped on the beach at Dunkirk. Uh, it is very difficult to imagine yeah. that the British would have continued the war. Yeah. So getting those troops off the beach and having it done by eight or nine hundred small ships, the smallest of which I've seen is fourteen foot four inches with an outboard motor boat. Most of them run by civilians. Um, the youngest was a fourteen year old boy, and the oldest a seventy eight year old man. Wow. Um, some of them by women. Uh, that is a a historical miracle. When you when you were working with Simon and Schuster and editing some of the you could you could name drop probably better than any guest we've ever had on this show, so you you're working with some some of the historical people who wrote books that you were editing. Did they were they aware of your own history and, and your own uh, contributions? Well, I think so. I mean, I worked very closely with with David McCullough, who's a very dear friend, um, and with Henry Kissinger, who's also a very dear friend of mine. Um, and so they, I mean, they, they they know they knew me well, and they 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 they, they understood where I come from, and probably what makes me tick. I mean, they probably knew what makes me tick better than I do. Um, yeah. And I'm I've always been somebody who's interested in history, and 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 very anxious to go back and as it were, pull it to pieces and look back on it from the advantage of being somewhat 
removed from it now. We're 77 right. years from Dunkirk, so we can look at it more objectively. What was and I also think that one of the things I learned is that you have to go back and find witnesses uh, who haven't been quoted and who are really interesting and have something interesting to say about any event. Uh, this this book is already number one. It's it's um, it's getting rave reviews already. How how does this compare? How do how, well? What did you think, or did you even see the movie Dunkirk? What did you think of that? I did. I did. I I, I had. By the way, when I started to write the book, I had no idea that Christopher Nolan was making the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and and when I finished the book, um, I I was only dimly aware of it because of course you know, I was lost in my own universe. Um, uh, that I went to see it um, in Red Hook, which is not very far from where we live, in, which is a small town up here. Um, and I saw it at three in the afternoon. And to my astonishment, first of all, but to my astonishment, there was not a single seat free. If I hadn't gotten there earlier, I wouldn't have gotten it. Really? Secondly, the audience stood up at the end of the movie and applauded, and half the audience were crying. And I thought to myself, my God, this is an event in English history that took place 77 years ago, before America was in the war. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were almost no women, except for a couple of nurses at the very end um, uh, in the movie. There's no real dialogue and story. Uh, it's a wonderful war movie, but that it gripped people so, so tightly that they could do that uh, was enormously interesting to me. And I guess that's surprising because it gripped me while I was writing the book. Uh, so I thought Dunkirk was wonderful. I think it's the best war film I've ever seen, um, and 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 the best crafted. And 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 I think the event provokes that kind of very deep emotion. It's an escape story. When you are six years old and you are somewhat aware of the events that are happening around you. And then you uh, juxtapose, what's the word, juxtapose, Robin? Juxta when you do that, whatever that's called, uh, uh, layer it over. Juxtaposing is good. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, here, an editor on the phone. I can say juxta. Yeah, he knows. Edit it. <laughs> so, but you juxtapose that against your... It's hard to, it's the right word, but it's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> so you put that up against the, the, the view you had as six years old and the view you have as an adult. At six years old, you see the events. As an adult, you see the people who caused those events uh, for good and bad, um, does that younger perspective that is juxtaposed on top of the newer perspective give you kind of a, a little advantage over the person who maybe was already an adult when this all started going down? Because you could see yes, it through I the child's eyes. Does. I, I, I think, first of all, I think seeing things through a child's eyes is often, uh, children often see more clearly than uh, grown-ups, frankly. Um, but, but also, you have a, a frame of reference. I can remember so much of what went on, and I remember we anti-aircraft trenches being dug out in the park outside our house in London. I remember everybody was issued with a gas mask because it was expected that when war broke out, the Germans would bomb and gas London, uh, which they did not do. Um, and you had okay. to carry it at all times. Um, yes. And, and I can remember there was an entire government um, uh, program called uh, Operation Pied Piper, of all things, um, under which 2,500,000 children from London and cities to, to, in the south of England were, were evacuated by train north to, 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 to safer parts of the country because it was expected that the war would involve the total destruction of, of, of British cities uh, uh, immediately. Um, and I was one of the children who was swept up um, and, and evacuated with my name in a piece of cardboard hung around my neck on a string and my Gosh. gas mask, and, and then eventually evacuated from there to Canada. Um, uh, so, I mean, there are things that I remember which are not, I mean, they're not necessarily terrible things to remember. They aren't terrible at all. But they give me a frame, a personal frame yeah, of reference yeah. under, around which I can build a story of other people wow. and what happens. And is that where the title comes from? Alone? The title alone, it's interesting you should say that. Yes, of course, it refers somewhat to my being alone, my sense of aloneness, which I think 
um, was inevitable when you were shipped like a parcel um, you know, to the north of England and from there to Canada, uh, with several hundred other children on the ships all throwing up for ten days or two weeks. Right. Um, but 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 it also comes from what Churchill said at the beginning of the evacuation of the Dun- uh, of, of Dunkirk. He said, um, uh, "We uh, we shall never surrender. We shall fight on." If necessary, for years, we shall fight on, if necessary, alone. And so that's really where I pulled the mm-hmm. title of alone from. It's that, it's that wonderful pause before he says it, if necessary, alone. And the British did fight alone from May. That's from fascinating. End of May 1940 till 1940, summer of 1941, when, when, when Hitler um, attacked the Soviet Union, and December 7th of 1941 when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and brought America into the, in, into the war. So this is really, in part, the story of that period in which, in which the British fought alone. It uh, seems like you were more mature than your years. Did you help bring comfort to the other children that you were traveling with? Well, that's a... <laughs> It's a hard question to answer, and I'll tell you why. I was born, fortunately for me, with a very good stomach. So, um, uh, although mine is not necessarily a maritime um, uh, family, um, Mm -hmm. I've never been seasick or airsick or anything like that. Um, uh, On the other hand, there were probably 500 other children on board the ship who were sick for the entire 10 days or 14 days. So I, there was very little opportunity to speak to them because they were oh, constantly yeah. throwing up. Oh, wow. Just, I, 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 I can't wait to finish this one. The book is called Alone, Britain, Churchill, and Dunkirk, Defeat into Victory. Michael Corda is our guest. It's such an honor to have you on the show, sir. We're not done, but we do have phone calls. Are you okay with taking phone calls? I'm absolutely okay. Okay, let me do this. Uh, thank you for calling and for waiting. Good morning. You're on there with Michael Corda. Yes, good morning, sir. Uh, um, good morning. One of the rescue boats was piloted by uh, Mr. Lightoller of Titanic fame uh, um, in that evacuation from Dunkirk, and I'll hang up and listen to your answer. All right, yes, thank you. That's wonder- it's wonderful that you know that. That one of the uh, light hauler was the second officer on board the Titanic, um, and 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 uh, was a remarkable man because uh, uh, he's the one who put out the order that the lifeboats were to be fi- filled and reserved for women and children, and and therefore um, the lifeboats were launched even if they were partly empty without any men in them. Uh, and when the ship went down, Lightholler um, uh, uh, found his way onto a raft and assembled, I think, 12 or 15 people on this raft and made them row and sing all night long to keep them from freezing or, 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 or simply losing hope until dawn came and they were picked up. And Lightholler, who was then not a young man, of course, um, took his yacht, um, uh, off to the Dunkirk beaches with um, his, I think, teenage son and with a teenage sea scout um, hmm. uh, and, and picked troops up off the beaches and took hundreds of troops off the beaches in his small boulder yacht um, and brought them back to England. It's a remarkable story. I'm very, very glad you asked that question because it's, it's one of the most extraordinary personal stories and it forms in part um, the basis for one of the stories that's that's in Dunkirk, uh, the the film, and and I deal a lot with Lighthaller in my book, who was, uh, of course, a, an aggressive and difficult man, but very courageous and so amazing to set sail in such a small motor yacht with your own your, with your own son and a teenage sea scout as your crew. Yeah, and the end of uh, the movie uh, of Dunkirk, you said people stood up and and gave it a standing ovation in a movie theater. You, you won't have the uh, you won't be able to see people standing up and applauding and t- crying at the end of your book, but I think that'll happen, and I think that the reason that we are applauding books like yours and movies like Dunkirk is because the world right now 
is starting to resemble the world before World War II, and this kind of gives us hope that maybe we'll survive this one, too. Oh, I think so. I never lose hope of survival. Obviously, one sometimes turns out to be wrong about that. Um, uh, but, but I think that if anything is demonstrated by the period from the beginning of the Second World War to Dunkirk in May 1940, it's that Churchill was right. Giving in to tyrants is always a mistake. And and um, uh, we we should have learned that lesson then, um, and it should have been engraved permanently in, into our minds so that we don't have to question it now. Uh, quite, quite. I think also. Oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, quite often when I have a guest on the show, and I'm looking at the Amazon page, the guest doesn't even know where their book stands in the in the rankings on Amazon. And currently, I don't know if you know this, but your book is number one. And your the Kindle version of your book is number two, so <laughs> you you've got the same book <laughs> on this list twice, once in Kindle, once in, in a hardcover version. That's that. well, that, you know, you, you know something that's that, that that's actually a, a, a very cheerful thing to, to happen. It's the best thing that's happened to me this morning, apart from being on this show, since the rest of it has all been a terrible plumbing disaster. <laughs> um, but, but, but <laughs> that's an antidote to the plumbing disaster. And <laughs> but let me just say, you, you know something? It, 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 for me, the, the excitement in writing a book comes from the discovery of things and putting them down on paper. The book itself is not such a huge issue with me once it's happened. Um, it, it, I, yeah, what I hope right, is right. that it conveys to people my excitement in this subject. And, 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 and the subject of, of Dunkirk, of Churchill, of the survival of England in 1940, is an uplifting one because it proves, first of all, that ordinary people can master even great wartime events somehow, mm -hmm. um, if they have the mind and the resolve and the guts to do it. Um, and I think that that is an important lesson for people to know. And it also explains to anybody who cares why the British have voted, for, or the English rather, have voted for Brexit now. Because there's an instinctive English feeling that in times of difficulty, you would treat the White Cliffs of Dover. And as it were, bring the curtains down and shut out the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. That's what happened to them in May of 1940, and it's what I think they're trying to do now. So it, the, the events in this book, strangely enough, help to explain events now, some of them at any rate. Oh, interesting. Uh, you have uh, Marlena Dietrich in your book. Uh, Larry and I play music for assisted living facilities, and when we play the song Lily Marlene, uh, the gentleman there have tears they start to cry yeah it makes men cry that song it does oh, and, of course. and 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 she was you know just such a uh, moving factor her in that song oh she was very uh, i should explain my entire family consists of people on my father's side consists of people who made m movies my father was an art director and won the um academy award in 1940 for the thief of Baghdad. Um, my uncle Alex was a movie producer and director, and my uncle Zoltan was a movie director. And 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 my uncle Alex actually gave Marlene Dietrich her first role in a silent movie in 1927, I think, in Berlin. Wow. So Marlene Dietrich was like a kind of honorary grandmother to me when we lived in in briefly in Los Angeles. Um, and and I and and I I felt that she ought to be in the book because her her voice and her character you know resounded in in 1940 and 1941 uh, she, with that absolutely great courage and 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 brilliant spirit that she had um she was a very important voice uh, in that period before america entered the war um and I always found her a very moving figure, so I, I, I just said to myself, I have to find a place in this book for Marlene Dietrich. Michael, you, you uh, dedicate the book in memory of Margaret, and then it says whose idea it was. Who is Margaret? Uh, Margaret was my wife. Um, she died in April of this year uh, oh, of, a, of a brain tumor. Um, and, um, and it had been her idea, because I, the, my two previous books 
my previous book was a very long biography of Robert E. Lee, and before that, a long, even longer biography of Lawrence of Arabia, and before that, I'd done Ike. And she said to me, you know, it takes you four years to write a long biography. Why don't you do something shorter this time, and, and not a big biography? And I said, well, I, that's a good idea, and it sounds fun, but I have no idea what I'd do. And she said, well, why don't you write a book about Dunkirk? And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, you know, she's right. I would love to write a book about Dunkirk. And yeah. she was right. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'm sorry that she's not here to see the finished book because it would have given her a great deal of pleasure. Little did you know, right, that this would somehow be a popular topic uh, at the same time as, as the book came out. The book came out yesterday, by the way. It's called Alone. It's written by Michael Corda. If you call and get it, you will be one of the privileged few who gets a free one because the rest of us have to go buy it, <laughs> including <laughs> me. I, I, I will get this one for sure. Um, but the one that was sent to me, I won't keep. I'll give it away. If you want it, call me right now, 622-9622. I found it on Amazon, and it's getting really great reviews. It only came out yesterday, so there's not too many reviews. But it's number one in print and number two in Kindle. So Gosh. <laughs> it's got both positions. I think it would be terrific. That alone would be a terrific book to read in Kindle. The only trouble is in Kindle, I don't think you get the maps and the illustrations. Um, but 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 um, I read a lot of books in Kindle myself, and uh, and I hope people will read it, whether it's in book form or in Kindle form, um, and enjoy it. I, I had a good time writing it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, me... You have two huge personalities in your book, uh, Neville Chamberlain and, and Winston Churchill. Yes, I think the opposition of them. I think Neville Chamberlain comes in for um, uh, that, he, that he's he's brushed off by people in a way that is un, unjust to him. Um, uh, I don't like Chamberlain that much as a character, whereas I not only like Churchill, I I'm, I, I I met him a couple of times, and I went to school with his grandson. Um, but Chamberlain was a an unfortunate political character. He was a very strong, powerful man, but enormously experienced politician, but rather like LBJ, except without the Southern um, <laughs> of course. Uh, um, he, 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 he absolutely believed that he was doing the right and moral thing at all times, even when he wasn't. So he got it wrong, wow. and yet he persisted in believing that he had it right. Um, and so I tried to be fair to Chamberlain, because if nothing else, what he did was to try and keep us out of a war that he saw coming. And everybody wanted to be kept out of that war. What he did not realize is that everything that he did was in vain, because Hitler was going to make that war happen anyway. Um, wow. And the Churchill had been right um, that you couldn't trust Hitler. Do the, Hitler would start a war. Just to reference um, uh, yeah. another book that you wrote, do, do the people who are pulling down the Robert E. Lee statues, do they understand Robert Lee? I mean, you studied him. Do, is, our, it do, is it justified to uh, try to rid ourselves of his memory? I do not think so. I, 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 I deplore the Confederacy, and of course I deplore slavery. And Lee himself was amb ambivalent about the Confederacy, um, and um, and and had mixed feelings about slave slavery. And I, I tried to deal with them very frankly in my biography of Lee. But I think he was, in his own way, a great man and a significant factor in American history. And I also don't think that it serves any purpose to bring down the monuments of the past, mm -hmm. that, that nobody's life will be made better by bringing down a statue of Robert E. Lee. That won't improve education, yeah. it won't produce right. more jobs, right. 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 Um, it, won't, it won't do anything except to leave an empty pedestal where Lee's statue had been, and why do that? Michael, you seem so humble, and, and yet we're so honored to have you on our show. Um, thank you so much for being on the air. Let me give away the book. I promised it to somebody. Uh, good morning. You've got the book. Who's this? Uh, this is Jim Penner. Jim, you've got it. You're going to like this one. It's gonna, it'll be waiting for you here. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, hope, I, I hope he enjoy. I hope he enjoys it. I think he will. You've you've done such a great job. I'm amazed that you that this took a shorter period of time than some of the other books. <laughs> that's just that's part of my amazement. <laughs> well, the other books were much longer. <laughs> um, but um, but 
you know something? The, the important thing is what, when you're writing something is to enjoy writing. Because if you don't enjoy it, then how, how are you going to make other people enjoy it? Oh, that's a good, good philosophy. And as an editor, uh, for Simon & Schuster, of all places, of um, uh, I mean, that's you couldn't get it from a better yeah, source. Holy grail. Uh, thank you. Michael, thank you for being on the air with us today. Thank you so much for having me, and I hope both of you have a very, very good day. Thank you. We will be right back. How would you like to win a new home and make a difference for Hospice of Marion County, the only not-for-profit hospice in the county? On Top of the World and Hospice are offering you a chance to win a brand new home right here in Ocala. All proceeds benefit Hospice of Marion County. Purchase your raffle entries for a chance to win a brand new home for only $100 at HomeFreePrize.com. The more you buy, the better your chance of winning. For complete rules and regulations and to purchase your entries, 